Hey guys, Lucas Cursor here, and welcome back to another episode of Method Ministries. Today, I'm going to talk about entire sanctification, most commonly known as Christian perfection, but I prefer the term entire sanctification because I believe it's more accurate, and then it helps to clear up any confusions that um, some people might have due to that. The reason why I'm making this video and not a part two to Romans chapter 9, if you remember the last episode, was part run on Romans chapter 9, just exegeting that. And I did say I'm going to make a part 2. I still plan on doing that. But I figured I would just do this episode on entire sanctification because I've been learning more about it and I wanted to share what, what um, I learned. Now since I, I feel more confident and, uh, and you know, can just have a better understanding in this and the, um, the moral of the story that this teaches in the scriptures for Christians just supplying you know, the grace of God and how that allows us to overcome sin. So I want to talk about that. And people have been reaching out to me uh, asking, hey, you know, you know, what does Wesley teach on this? Can you explain this doctrine? So I thought that was kind of cool. I was a little bit, um, you know, encouraged by that. People are interested in this, you know, whether that's to see if the scriptures teach that or not. Hopefully it's to test that by the scriptures because that's what we should be doing, testing all things by the scriptures. So let's test uh, entire sanctification by the scriptures. To do that, though, I'm going to have to talk about it. Real quick, though, um, I do just want to say thank you again to my viewers. We hit 2,000 subscribers on YouTube. I think we're at 2,100 right now or in uh, almost 2,200. Maybe, if I'm not being too ambitious, maybe by the end of the year we can hit 3,000. If so, I would be uh, excited to, to do so, and hopefully by the grace of God, we can hit that. And by the way, if you can like and share uh, these videos, um, and you know that helps the algorithm, helps YouTube, even Spotify, Apple Podcasts to know that, um, hey, people are giving this some attention and it helps them to to put that in front of uh, uh, people's faces so that just has more reach. And if you can even drop a review on Spotify, that, again, helps and uh, just, you know, again, get get more reach. So um, I really appreciate that. Don't forget also to follow on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. So thank you again for all my, uh, you know, listeners and subscribers. So let's talk about Christian perfection. So I keep on calling it Christian perfection. Again, um, I prefer the term entire sanctification. I'll explain why in a bit. Um, but if I keep referring to Christian perfection, just know Lucas doesn't prefer that term. He, he prefers entire sanctification. And I will include in the description two book links. So the book links are for your own further study, and which I recommend you do. The first one, which is one I really recommend, is just reading it from John Wesley himself. John Wesley wrote a book, A Plain Account of Christian Perfection. That way you can hear what he taught on this subject in his own words as a primary source, not as a secondary. As a secondary source, I recommend Dr. Kenneth J. Collins, his work, The Theology of John Wesley, Holy Love and the Shape of Grace. This, this work just puts the, the belief of, of uh, Wesley in a systematic way for us so we can understand what he taught systematically recommend this work. Also, I did do an interview with Dr. Kenneth J. Collins a couple months back. If you haven't watched that, go watch that. That was one of my favorite interviews. I was really encouraged by it. Dr. Collins is a, is a godly man, and um, you know, I was just blessed to, to have him on, on the show. It really was one of my favorite interviews, and I was just, you know, I, you know, I walked away feeling feeling encouraged in, in the faith and just to, you know, go and, and, and live my life to, you know, to the glory of God. So again, if you haven't listened to the interview, I highly recommend you go listen to that interview. So let me just define entire sanctification for us, and then we'll talk about it. So entire sanctification is the belief that a believer, by faith in God, can be filled with the love of God and the, and the love for his neighbor, so that holy love replaces sin. That's entire sanctification. That, that's the belief, that a Christian, by faith in God, can be filled with the love for God and love for neighbors so that holy love replaces sin. That's the, the belief of entire sanctification. You don't have to wait for this. It's not posterior to death. A Christian by faith can actually experience that now by faith. So let's draw this out and we'll, we'll understand on what John Wesley taught by this. If, if you hear my uh, mouse going off, that's because I'm clicking through some slides. I did plan on do, making this a um, a video. For some reason, I'm having Wi-Fi problems, so I'm gonna have to get that sort sorted out. So for now, this will, this will be just another audio episode. But most people, I feel like that that doesn't bother them because they're listening 
uh, not, not watching the video, they just have it playing in the background. So let's understand the key, the key to understanding Christian perfection and Tyre sanctification. And the key to understanding this is that to know that in Wesley's theology, there are two types of sin, okay? There are two types of sin. And this is really crucial to understanding this because if we don't understand this, we won't understand Christian perfection. We won't understand what Wesley taught on this and how he arrived to this and how he distinguished between uh, entire sanctification and how a belief can still be in a non-glorified body. If we do understand this, we'll understand this doctrine clearly. Even if we don't agree with it, we'll still understand it. So the two types of sin, according to Wesley, are, are voluntary and involuntary sins. So voluntary sins are the sins that we commit willingly. Those are the sins that we know not to do, and yet knowing it, we still go and do it. We voluntarily have a knowledge, a conscious will, and we commit it despite what we know. We voluntarily did it. It was our choice. We are fully cognizant aware. We voluntarily committed this sin. That's what sin is. That's how John Wesley defined sin. Sin is the voluntary transgression of the law. And then the involuntary sins those are the ones that we don't willingly do, but those are our weaknesses and infirmities, the things that we just naturally fall short of and need growth in. Those are the involuntary sins. So not all sin is voluntary. Some is involuntary. Some are just our weaknesses. So those, those are the things that we just fall short of. Those are our natural infirmities, our natural weaknesses. The, the sins that we, the, the, the ones that we commit voluntarily, those are sins. That's how John Wesley defines actual sin. So another way to say this is, is to distinguish between sin and actual sin. And if you study, study Jacob Arminius, and especially looking at him um, in his doctrine of original sin, Jacob Arminius even distinguished between this, you know, sin um, in, in this type of way as well with putting the contrast between sin and actual sin. So like infants, infants, they are born fallen with a fallen nature due, that, due to the offspring or due to the fact that they're the offspring of Adam. And original sin is the penalty of Adam's sin passing on to his offspring. So children are born sinners. But that's not their actual sin. Their actual sin is what they actually commit. And that's what God actually imputes and counts as sin. Yes, there are, there are born sinners that have a sinful nature, but their actual sin is what they voluntarily, willingly commit. So there's a difference between sin and actual sin. And that's very helpful for Christians to recognize these two types of sin. Because it helps me to look out for, okay, what are the things that I'm willingly doing knowing that I shouldn't do? What, what's Lucas Curcio willingly committing? What am I willingly committing? What what types of sin do I know I shouldn't be doing and I'm doing? It helps me to realize, okay, I got to cut this out in, in life. Yes, I, you know, I know I have weaknesses. I know I have infirmities that I fall short of. But what are the things that I'm willingly committing? That helps me to distinguish between um, the areas in my life that I, I can really work on and really, really need to, to strive to overcome by the grace of God. So that I can be filled with the love of God. Holy love replacing sin. And by the way, when we use holy love, when Wesleyans use holy love, what do we mean by that? Well, that means that love is defined by God. So when we, you know, when, when the world says like love is love, well, that doesn't define love. That, you know, that means nothing. That's like saying north is north. That's like saying sharp is sharp, right? Like a knife cuts people. It's sharp. Well, what's sharp? Well, we don't define sharp by saying sharp is sharp. It has to be something outside of that that defines what sharp is. Sharp is something that has the potential, I guess, to harm you or to, to slice through an object. So when we say holy love, we're saying God defines love. God is love. That's what First John says. God is love. So holy love is defined by God and it comes from God. So holy love replaces sin. That's what entire sanctification is. And the key to understanding that is to know that there's two types of sin. There's voluntary and involuntary sins. There's sin and actual sin. And sin is the voluntary transgression of the law. And because of this, entire sanctification is not sinless perfection. 
So when 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 Wesleyans say, okay, we believe in, in Christian perfection, we're not saying Christian sinlessness, as in Christians don't ever sin or can't ever sin. That's not what Christian perfection teaches. It is not sinless perfection. And, and, and the reason why is because a believer, though he won't be voluntarily transgressing the law, he'll still have his natural infirmities and weaknesses that he'll fall short of. He'll never be without those involuntary ones until you know, um, until death. Which means that, that a Christian, as long as he exists on this earth, will still have the potentials to sin. So entire sanctification doesn't mean that a believer doesn't need to grow anymore, or that he's arrived. It just means that holy love will replace sin so that he won't voluntarily sin, but not to be in a state of sinless perfection because he'll still have those involuntary weaknesses. And I'm going to read to you what John Wesley said on this because this, this will draw out more of the, the you know what this doctrine actually teaches. And again, it's a primary source that's coming from John Wesley himself. So I'll be quoting from the book of A Plain Account of Christian Perfection. And again, I recommend you get that book. So this is what John Wesley said on this, okay? Regarding um, sinless perfection. He says, sinless perfection is a phrase I never use. So John Wesley never uses that. He goes on, less should seem to contradict myself. I believe a person filled with the love of God is still liable to these involuntary transgressions. Such transgressions you may call sins if you please. I do not. For the reasons above mentioned. So here we see the two types of sin that Wesley distinguishes bleeding over into Christian perfection and how it shapes and forms and how he arrives at the doctrine of Christian perfection or as I like to call it, entire sanctification. So a believer will be filled with the love of God. His, his voluntary transgression will be, will be replaced by holy love for God and love for neighbor. But it's not sinless perfection because he'll still have those involuntary transgressions or he'll still be liable to these involuntary transgressions. He'll still come short. He'll still have the potential to come short. And you may call these involuntary sin, you know, um, shortcomings sins, but John Wesley doesn't because he defines sin as the voluntary breaking of God's law. Do you see, do you understand a little bit more? Hopefully we understand a little bit more on what entire sanctification means and why it's still not sinless perfection. Because again, just to really drive this home, you'll still be uh, liable to involuntary transgressions and you'll still need to grow. It doesn't mean you stop growing once you uh, are in the state of entire sanctification, which is to be filled with a holy love of God or in holy love for God and love for neighbor. So now let's talk about, okay, so how does this, how does this come about, right? Like, like how do Christians, if this is true, how do Christians, according to Wesley, arrive in the state of entire sanctification where they're filled with a love with the holy love of God for God and love for neighbor. How do they arrive there? So this is what John Wesley says, and this is very important. So it's not by works. It's not by, okay, was Lucas completely sinless for 24 hours? And then go, you know, go down a list. Did I do this? Did I do this? Did I say this? Did I think this? Did I have this intention? So this is what John Wesley says, and I'm going to be quoting from his plain account of Christian perfection. He says, as to the manner, as to the manner, I believe this perfection is always wrought in the soul by simple act of faith. Consequently, in an instant. So John Wesley believed that Christian perfection can come and comes, and I would even add only comes by faith, a simple act of faith, and that and therefore it can come in an instant, so you don't have to wait for it. And he goes on to say, though, I, but I believe a gradual work both proceeding and following that instant so John Wesley also acknowledges that, that sometimes it could come gradually. And he goes on to say, as to the time, I believe this instant generally is the instant of death, the moment before the soul leaves the body. So he, he's saying that Christians experience this the moment before death, before the soul leaves the body. But I believe, he says, it may be 10, 20, or 40 years before. So, he, so, so John Wesley is saying that people can also sometimes experience this before death. And he goes on, I believe it is usually many years after justification, but that it may be within five years or five months after it. I know no conclusive argument to the contrary. So, let's, so let me just break that down, what, what John Wesley is arguing. So first, first again, to, to, um, to know about this is that it comes by faith. You don't have to wait for it. You can receive 
um, entire sanctification, that is the indwelling of holy love for God and love for neighbor, replacing sin so that you are no longer committing voluntary transgressions, not that you're without the liable potential to commit or have involuntary transgressions. So it comes by faith. It's by faith we receive this. Some people have different experiences of this. This some some people may experience it. You know, you know, as he says, like twenty years or ten years or five years before or five months. Everybody has a different experience of this. But the method is the same. It comes by faith, but just the experience is different. And what John Wesley is saying is that that this happens, but right before the soul leaves the body, which is another way to say is that when we'll die, we'll be entirely sanctified. This is an easier way to say that. But John Wesley also believes it can happen beforehand. So John Wesley has, has um, I guess, the word optimism, if I want to use that. Wesley is optimistic by the grace of God that God's grace is sufficient to come in this life now so you can be in a state of holy love for God and holy love for neighbor. And that's the moral of the story when it comes to Christian perfection because Wesley, you know, what you got to understand is that Wesley was dealing with antinomianism. And antinomianism means, the word anti means against, and nomianism comes from, from the, the Greek word for law. So antinomianism is the belief that Christians, because God's grace is here and a reality for believers, therefore they don't have to uh, obey God and it doesn't matter. You know, it's easy believism. It's cheap grace. So John Wesley was constantly at, at war, at battle with, with, with that idea that, because God's grace is, is uh, sufficient for us, therefore it doesn't matter if we obey God and we shouldn't pursue holiness or we don't need to pursue holiness. And John Wesley was saying, no, you don't have to live defeated lives as Christians. By God's grace, we can overcome sin. And that's the moral of the story, that God's grace can overcome sin. And it's sufficient to overcome sin. Paul says in Romans chapter 6, um, in verse 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. I believe that's verse 14 in Romans chapter 6. So sin, Paul says, he says in Romans 6, I'm just going to bring that up real quick. You might hear me clicking on my keyboard. So he says in verse 14, for sin shall not be master over you, for you're not under law, but under grace. So that by, so, you know, again, God's grace, can we can overcome sin. So this idea that, oh, you know, Christians aren't perfect or Christians will sin every day. Well, John Wesley challenged that. John Wesley says that's not true. We, you know, John Wesley would, would say essentially, you know, where do you see that in the scriptures? I don't see that in the scriptures. Instead, what we do see is this call for Christians to be holy. We see this call for Christians to be sanctified. This call to Christians to go on to perfection, to go on to maturity, to completeness in Christ. And we don't have to say, oh, I, you know, I'm a Christian, I'm going to fall short. You know, I, I, um, I like to use the analogy that when, imagine if somebody was in an interview with a boss or a potential boss, you were, you were in an interview for a potential job. You wouldn't sit there and tell your potential company that you're, you're going to work for, listen, uh, I'm going to come, sh- you know, I'm going to fall short at times. I'm not always going to hundred percent you know, follow your your company's guidelines. I'm gonna come. I'm gonna fall short of it. Like, like, don't expect that. Like, like, I'm probably gonna fail every day. You wouldn't sit there and tell a boss that. You wouldn't sit there and and you know work up this whole speech of negotiation that hey, listen, I'm gonna let you down and I'm gonna do this every day. I'm gonna let you down every day. You wouldn't do that. So why do we do it as Christians? Why do we tell Christians that you're gonna sin every day? You're gonna fall short at every day. When God's word says that sin shall not be master over you. Again, by God's grace, we can overcome sin. That's, that is the moral of the story. And that's, that's what I think we should draw away and come away with entire sanctification. So even if you don't believe in John Wesley's definition, even if you disagree with it, even if you don't hold to those two types of sins, the very least, take the principle of Christian perfection that, again, God's grace can overcome sin. You don't have to live a defeated life. That's not God's will for you. That's not God's wish for you. That's not God's desire for you. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. Okay? Yes, Christians will sin. You know, John says, if any man sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and, the, and yeah, he's the propitiation for our sins. 
and not for us only, but also for the sins of the whole world. That's 1 John 2, verses 1 through 2. So yes, Christians will sin, but that's not an excuse and a get-out-of-jail-free card to sin. We don't want to sin. We want to overcome sin by God's grace, and by God's grace, we can. The, you know, This gets me thinking of my other interview with Ben Witherington, where he talked about this um, belief in the second blessing, where you know, the second blessing would be, or the sec, you know, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which comes like post, post, um, post salvation, like like when you get saved, but you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, then you need to get filled with the Holy Spirit. That's wrong. Ben, you know, Worthington pointed out that believers are filled with the Holy Spirit at the moment of faith, the moment of conversion. So, in terms of second blessings, there are second blessings. But however many blessings God wants to give us, that's how many blessings we want to want to get. So if God blesses us twice, a third time, a fourth time, a fifth time, I want to get all the blessings I, I can, can have from God. I want to be filled with holy love. I want to be loving God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and my neighbor as myself. I don't want to be voluntarily committing sins. And I read God's word. He tells me to pursue this, and I can have this by faith. I can have Victory by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he didn't save me to be to be a man just living in sin every day. He saved me so I can obey him and love him every day. And love is the fulfillment of the law. So hopefully we, we fleshed this out, what holy love is. Any questions, reach out to me. Again, if you can leave an inter, um, a review and like and share, that would be, that would be, uh, you know, I, that would mean a lot to me. I'd be very, very, uh, you know, gracious, or I mean, I, you know, I can't speak, you know, I guess it's from staying up, up, not getting as much sleep with my uh, newborn daughter, but I would just be, be, be very thankful for that. And thank you for all my listeners. And until next time, we'll, we'll be continuing our, our podcast series, trying to go into more to Wesleyan doctrine and trying to exegete the scriptures. And again, I'm always here to talk and thank you once more. And I hope you have a blessed day.